Welcome everybody to Rush University Medical Center Division of Nephrology Renal Biopsy Conference for June 13, 2024. We do have a CME code today, 491628. Uh, this conference is being recorded and we'll upload it onto our YouTube uh, Renal Biopsy Conference. You can just search uh, YouTube Rush Renal Biopsy Conference, you'll find it. We've got quite a few up there and Dr. Baxi's now put them in some categories. So if you're looking for anything specific for teaching purposes, or review, you can uh, pick it by the topic. Uh, as usual, we have nothing to um, disclose, and the uh, patient's uh, information has been preserved and uh, changed to, uh, to maintain uh, some sort of uh, privacy for them. Um, I'd like to start um, with a special slide here. If you can uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Baxi. It is Dr. Corbett's birthday. And I have a little chronological uh, history of them. Kind of delayed there, but there's Steve uh, when he was to play football, and he's got that massive arm. And then he, here he is with his family. As it's passing along, he's becoming a fellow here. And you'll see different versions of him, with or without mustache, with or without gray hair. And we all get older, but he's always handsome. Um, only gets better. <laughs> Uh, that's Steve in one of his uh, saltier moods there. Uh, he was a little concerned about his uh, hair color at one point, so on the far bottom left, he was uh, he actually uh, had a, a really bad toupee. No, that was uh, something, uh, one of the patients had a, a wig and he had some fun with it in the dialysis unit one day. That is not his hair color. Uh, but he, he's, he's uh, graduated from uh, long hair to, to short hair, dark hair to gray hair, mustache or no mustache. Now the bottom right, you can see how great he looks for for his age, and congratulations, Steve. Happy birthday. Uh, hope you're not too mad at me, so. Oh, man. I couldn't leave out the finger one. That's such a great picture. It's just, you know. Well, you're don't worry. Not, I had a feeling you were going to see that finger one. the wrong thing. What would you say, Bill? I said, don't worry. I have a feeling you're going to see that finger live. <laughs> <laughs> not no. just on the picture. <laughs> no. That's a good point, yeah. Shortly after the conference. So there we go. Happy birthday, Steve. And then uh, I think we can move on to the conference. So, Hamoud, are you reading it? Wow, how did somebody do that on the chat? That's amazing. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I am reading it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so hello, everyone. So let's begin. Uh, so our patient is a 70-year-old Hispanic man with past medical history of type 2 diabetes and hypertension who initially presented for evaluation of proteinuria. Uh, he has had intermittent lower extremity edema in the past, which initially was thought to be uh, partly from uh, some venous insufficiency and uh, amlodipine. Uh, after stopping his uh, amlodipine and starting him on diuretics, his edema resolved. But then again, about two months prior to his current presentation to our clinic, he noticed that his bilateral lower extremity edema is back again, but this time he was not on any amlodipine. At that time, his uh, workup showed uh, uh, a creatinine, serum creatinine of 0 0.98 milligram per deciliter and uh, a new kind of proteinuria. His uh, UPCR was like protein to creatinine ratio was about 18 and a half grams per gram. At that time, his serum albumin was 2.8. And then he was referred to nephrology. Uh, one month after that, he still hasn't seen us, but one month after that, the repeat uh, urine protein to creatinine ratio was about 9.6 gram per gram. Uh, based on the previous records that were available, um, he only had one quantification uh, that was about three, three and a half years ago. That was urine albumin to creatinine ratio. It was 21 milligrams per gram. Uh, we didn't have any in, uh, information between that in terms of his protein urea. So on initial evaluation at our clinic, uh, his main complaint was this bilateral lower extremity edema. Otherwise, he did not have any other complaints. He denied any personal history of uh, malignancy, any uh, chronic infections, any illnesses, drug use, uh, any family history of kidney disease. Regarding his birth history, it, he wasn't sure about uh, uh, much of the details. Uh, he did not use any NSAID regularly, but uh, he was using indomethacin on and off uh, uh, when he used to have gout flares. His last one was about uh, three years ago. 
uh, in terms of his uh, review of system. Uh, other than this uh, lower extremity edema, he did not have any other complaints. Uh, his past medical history, as mentioned above, he had uh, type 2 diabetes. That was about uh, more than at least eight years ago and hypertension diagnosed at least uh, 10 years ago or more. He did have gout, hyperlipidemia, obesity, sleep apnea. In terms of his medication, he was on hydrochlorothiazide, 25 milligrams, losartan, 50 milligrams, metformin, 1,000 uh, twice a day, and uh, potassium chloride, uh, 20 meqs daily. Uh, he denied any tobacco, alcohol, or drug use, and he was retired now and used to be a construction worker. His family history, he did have diabetes and hypertension in the family as well. Otherwise, no, as mentioned earlier, no history of uh, uh, kidney disease that he knew of in the family or any autoimmune diseases. Physical exam, when he presented to us, his blood pressure was about 147 over 72. Uh, other vitals were stable uh, within the normal range. He was saturating fine on room air. His weight was 89 kilograms with a height of 5 feet 6 inches and BMI of 32, so slight obesity. Uh, on the physical exam, he did not have uh, any, uh, uh, he was doing fine, comfortably, grossly, looked okay. Uh, no, uh, uh, his ENT exam was normal, no macroglossia. His, uh, he did have uh, an eye exam done uh, about two years ago, and there was no uh, evidence of diabetic retinopathy. Uh, his lungs were clear, heart exam was normal, abdomen was okay. Uh, at the time of presentation, he had about one plus uh, bilateral lower extremity edema, otherwise no rash or no neurological findings. Uh, when he got his labs done with us, uh, you can see a CMP sodium 140, potassium 3.8, chloride 102, bicarb 26, BUN 16, and creatinine of 1, which it was stable uh, at least over the past few months. Uh, glucose 100, his calcium was uh, slightly on the higher side, corrected was 10.2, total protein 4.7, albumin 2.5, alphos and other level enzyme, they were within normal range. Uh, his uh, PTINR function was also okay within normal range. CBC, uh, you can see normal white count, hemoglobin 12.5, platelets 2.21, and normal differential. His, on his lipid profile, uh, he did have a few previous readings as well with high triglycerides, and this time total cholesterol was 331, and triglycerides were elevated to 700. Uh, HDL 46, LDL 147, and slight elevation in VLDL as well, 138. Uh, we did some serological studies. Uh, his ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA was negative. Complements were within normal range. Uh, NTPLA2R antibody was also negative. His infectious workup was negative, especially for hepatitis B and C and HIV. His serum immun uh, immunofixation and electrophoresis did not have any evidence of data proteins. Uh, on his dipstick, UA he had four plus protein, and with us, his uh, uh, urine protein creatinine ratio was about 14.5 grams per gram, and our lab was not able to uh, quantify the urine albumin creatinine ratio. On imaging, his kidney ultrasound uh, showed no hydronephrosis, size was within normal range, right side and left side 11 and 11.4 centimeter. His uh, kidney vessels were fine, no evidence of thrombosis. Uh, for his edema, Doppler was also done, uh, no evidence of lower extremity DVD. Uh, after that, uh, percutaneous uh, ultrasound guided kidney biopsy was performed by the two amazing uh, people. One of them just read the protocol. And the other one is just spoke up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions uh, on the protocol for any, for uh, Hamoud or uh, Dr. Whittier? Uh, any exposure to lead uh, someone's writing? Um, no. All right, pretty straightforward. We're going to start with poll one. Um, what do you think this biopsy is going to show? 
Um, diabetic nephropathy alone. Uh, number two is a podocyte. Everybody vote. Uh, it's uh, it's secret. A podocytopathy with or without background diabetic nephropathy. Obesity obesity related glomerulopathy with or without diabetic nephropathy. Membranous glomerulonephritis with or without diabetic nephropathy, or ALEC2 amyloidosis with or without diabetic nephropathy. Let's try to get a good representation here, and then we'll uh, we'll hand it over, discuss each of these options. Pretty good representation here. So, and it, okay, yeah, I think it's good. So, um, we have the uh, top vote is a podocytopathy with or without diabetic nephropathy, um, and you know that may be difficult to distinguish, I suppose, pathologically because you, I suppose, you could get diffuse foot process effacement with diabetic nephropathy. But uh, really, I'm just trying to get an idea of what you think the diagnosis is. Um, it's interesting, nobody picked diabetic nephropathy alone. Um, I would wonder if this wasn't a biopsy conference, um, if we wouldn't have a few people picking that. Um, Obesity-related GN, uh, one person. Membranous is, comes in second at 26%, and a few people bought into ALEC2 amyloidosis. Um, I am going to hand this over to the birthday boy. Uh, you can leave that poll up so Steve can kind of go through each of the options why he thinks... Um, what he thinks uh, of each of these and why, uh, what he thinks the, the biopsy is. Steve? Sure. Uh, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I think diabetic nephropathy has to be on the radar screen. The thing that's, that's kind of unusual about this is the renal function is quite good, and it seems that the proteinuria came fairly rapidly. Now, granted, it's been three and a half years, and I guess anything's possible. Um, I don't recall whether, and this is I'm getting old. I don't recall whether or not uh, there was retinopathy or neuropathy, but my recollection was the diabetes was what about eight years that they would had it. Um, so I think it's possible, but it, you know it's biopsy conference, and there's always something unusual going on here. And I personally like number two, and as I was writing down my differential, you know, diabetes with a podocytopathy, whether it be quote unquote minimal change disease or uh, a tip-like lesion. Um, I mean, the creatinine is quite good. You know, 1.0 is not bad. Um, and and yet this there's this kind of, I'm going to say, sudden onset of, you know, fairly significant, well, of massive proteinuria and hypoalbuminemia and edema. So I think that number two is like, is my favorite. Obesity-related glomerulopathy, I mean, they're rarely nephrotic. And it usually is much more indolent. It wouldn't be going from, you know, essentially normal, level of urine protein to all of a sudden 18 grams over a few years. I mean, it's a much more indolent process. Um, membranous um, is, I guess, always a possibility. It just seems that this is so sudden an onset uh, that it just, that it was, it was in my differential, but much lower down. And ALEC2, I mean, those patients usually have minimal proteinuria and have, have significant uh, interstitial disease and and present really with chronic kidney disease that's progressing. Uh, so I don't know, that to me is, you know, that that's kind of off my radar screen, except, you know, I know all of these, the caveat is always with background diabetes. The, the problem here is that this person's renal function, the creatinine is again, 1.0. So it's pretty, pretty doggone good. And with ALEC2, I, my impression was, at least the ones I've seen, is they, they have this kind of progressive renal insufficiency with minimal proteinuria. And that doesn't seem to be the case here. So I, I agree with the majority here that this is a podocytopathy with background diabetic nephropathy. And the question really will be, is it going to be nodular or just uh, diffuse diabetic glomerular sclerosis? And I, I without retinopathy, which remind me again, Hamoud, would, uh, was there retinopathy or no? There was not. Okay. So, you know, the, you know, in the, uh, in the ID and T trial, when, uh, when you guys did, uh, um, ophthalmologic exams and biopsies on all these patients, the ones that had no retinopathy were more likely than not to have just diffuse glomerular sclerosis, whereas the ones with retinopathy were more likely to have nodular disease. So if there's background disease, I'm going to guess that it would be more likely just the diffuse mesangial sclerosis. 
Yeah, and uh, just of note that a third of the patients with uh, with um, biopsy diagnosed uh, diabetic nephropathy did not have retinopathy. So right. it's the rule to, uh, the rule for type one does not hold true in type two. Uh, but you're right. I think that's a good point. Um, I really like your your first point about the creatinine and the, and the uh, being so normal with this degree of proteinuria. I think that would be unusual. And I also think it does sound from no microalbuminuria three years ago to have this this floor of the product range protein area, I, I agree, it does also seem unusual. Um, well, you don't, you don't have to be nice just because it's my birthday. No, but I'm trying to be nice because you started by saying you were old and I just felt bad for you, you know, and you couldn't, you couldn't <laughs> remember what was in the protocol. So I'm just trying, I'm trying, to, <laughs> trying to boost you up. No, I really think that's a good point. Yeah. Um, ALEC2, I, you know, I don't think it, it's, it's we, we had one, we've had it recently and, you know, it, it, you can see glomerular ALEC2, but, but, um, it's usually, like you said, more tubular proteinuria. I think this degree of proteinuria would be an unusual, but I mean, who knows? Uh, um, Casey, uh, what do you have to add to this? What's your diagnosis? I think I think Steve covered it pretty nicely. I, I agree. I think the uh, it's a little unfortunate we don't have the albumin creatinine ratio in the urine. It's too high to be quantified, but if it crosses that 90% threshold, I think that helps us, I think, zone in a little bit more on like a possible minimal change podocytopathy. Um, but we don't know what that is. But I, I agree with what Steve said. I think podocytopathy, given the nephrotic syndrome, it seems relatively sudden and uh, the very high cholesterol. That that to me makes sense. Uh, I also agree with the uh, number two being some kind of a PLA to our negative membranous. Uh, doc, Dr. Rubin was starting trouble by asking who performed the exam. We had this uh, discussion last week about uh, the paucity of of doctors doing their own retinal exam these days, and uh, not even having often ophthalmoscopes available. But uh, it was put in the chat that this was done, uh, I think, in Opto Clinic. So, Mario, since you're starting trouble, uh, what do you think? What do you think this? Well, what is? I wanted to point out is that classically, an internist that still uses an ophthalmoscope will miss diabetic retinopathy in 50% of the cases. A regular ophthalmologist will miss it in about 10 to 15% of the cases. A retina specialist will miss it in about 5%. Therefore, if you wanna make sure, classically you need to perform a retinal fluorescent angiogram in years past was a very complicated test. Nowadays, it's very simple. It's done in the office of an ophthalmologist, and that will exclude for sure a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. No, that's a good point. And I, and I, I my recollection is that's what they actually did in the IDT, IDNT trial. They got formal, uh, formal evaluations with fluorescein angiography. Yes, that, that is true. Mm -hmm. and it is a good point. Um, we did fluorescein angiograms for the IDNT. So when we say that a, a third of them didn't have it, that was probably a third of them didn't have it because that was done by ophthalmology and flu fluorescein. So, um, yeah. In terms of the differential, the only thing I'd like to add is that this patient has an impressive uh, hyperlipidemia, which, as we discuss in this conference repeatedly, could be an indirect marker of minimal change disease, uh, particularly if this was explosive in onset. Short of that, I agree with everyone else's. I, th <clears throat> I think um, it might be of interest to note that the progress in optometrist offices have been very impressive because now for $25, you can go and have your retinal photograph and get a copy of the photograph of your retina with just a little dilation and a 20 minute visit. You need to go to an ophthalmologist. And actually those retinal photographs are really beautiful. I suspect that if we want to work up a patient with diabetes, that a simple request to an optometrist for retinal photographs would suffice and it's perfectly Rapid, cheap, and very reliable. The other point I'd like to make is that if this patient does prove to have features of diabetic nephropathy, it will be virtually impossible on the basis of morphology to diagnose a photocytopathy because everything that a primary photocytopathy can do to the glomerulus 
diabetic nephropathy can do it. So uh, I, I'm not, I mean, if the patient has no features of diabetic nephropathy, maybe just a little bit of mesangial expansion, but not much thickening of basal membranes, maybe you can diagnose a superimposed primary photocytopathy. But if there are features of, you know, moderately advanced diabetic, it's hopeless. You can't make the distinction. Vic, does it help you that the, does it help you with respect to uh, the course with, res with regard to trying to determine one from the other? In other words, I guess yeah. a better way to say it is, if this is somebody, and unfortunately we don't know what happened over two years, but let's yeah. just say six months ago, we know the proteinuria was okay. And then all of a sudden they have this explosive nephrotic syndrome. And I, I think we've all yeah. seen these patients and then they have diabetic renal disease as well. You know, those patients, at least some that I've seen, if we treat them, yeah. They will go into remission like a photocyte, like a minimal change disease. But that's yeah. having that, you know, very close follow-up, if you will. I agree with you, Steve. But an acute onset of nephrotic syndrome from the photocytopathy secondary to diabetic nephropathy would be not expected. Now, <clears throat> antinephrin antibody may change the whole picture here. Yeah. Because if you've got a diabetic patient with a photocytopathy on electron microscopy and they have antinephrine antibody, it ain't due to diabetes. But of course, we don't have availability of the antibody yet. Maybe in another year we will, and then it'll really make things a lot simpler. Yeah. I have a question. That, does, does the... Um, the, uh, the the management of diabetes, as, as far as how well diabetes has been managed and controlled, change people's index of suspicion as far as nephropathy or not? In other words, controlled or uncontrolled diabetes, does that make you think less or more? Or any presence of diabetes could give you nephropathy regardless of control? I think that's a really good question. And I'll be interested to see what other people say, because it, people throw that out all the time. They're poorly controlled and therefore... Um, you more likely expect it, but you know, I, my experience, I've seen people present with asymptomatic diabetes to the point, you know, where they, they didn't even know they were diabetic until their nephropathy. So yeah. I don't know. I, I think it must have some correlation. And certainly if you're really tightly controlled, there's evidence that you won't develop as many complications or delay them. But I don't think it's as strong as it would be that it would, you would be intuitively. And it's what a lot of people, you know, will say, oh, he had terrible diabetes, therefore he must have this. But uh, do people agree with me or not? No, I think Well, I mean, I've seen a lot of patients with diabetic nephropathy who have hemoglobin A1Cs less than seven. Great. So uh, I, I don't know how, I'm not sure that it's reliable enough to say yeah. If this man's hemoglobin A1C has been under seven for the last three years, and now he has nephrotic syndrome, it cannot be diabetic nephropathy. I would say the answer is no. Yeah. No, but I think the other the, 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 uh, the flip side of that is, I think what Casey might have been alluding to is if it is uncontrolled, are they more likely? Yes. I think although most of us assume that that's the case, my, my impression is the literature doesn't always hold that out or hold that to be true. Now, Steve, um, I was under the understanding, please correct me, that if you have fully controlled diabetes, you have an increased production of H products, and H products tend to be nephrotoxic, and thus, if you have uncontrolled diabetes for a prolonged period of time, perhaps on that theory, you're more prone to develop diabetic nephropathy. I couldn't agree more with you. I just don't know that it's, I, I just don't recall anything that's actually, you know, borne that out. Not that I can think of, at least off the top used, of my head right now. I think it used to be talked that the microvascular complications such as retinopathy were much more tightly controlled, oh, sorry, tightly controlled is a funny word here, much more linked to um, uncontrolled diabetes. But there is some data now that um, that nephropathy also is, more frequent and uncontrolled and more progressive, even though that wasn't the original teachings back kind of back in the day. Um, other interesting points, if I could just share this for a second here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Um, so it always comes up on when to biopsy somebody with diabetes. And Sarah Sangvi from um uh Sangavi, sorry, from Seattle did a retrospective study where uh, they looked at all the patients that were biopsied who had diabetes, and 50% of them 
ended up having a non-diabetic lesion. And this kind of went a little viral, starting to say, oh my gosh, we really need to be biopsying all of our patients with diabetic with diabetes quite a bit more. But remember, when these patients were biopsied, the indication for the biopsy was not, oh, we think they have diabetes. It was they had something unusual, which triggered the nephrologist to want to biopsy hematuria, sudden onset, so on and so forth. When the clinical nephrologist thought that the patient, or sorry, when the patient was thought to clinically have diabetic nephropathy, this study was done, which was already brought up, which was the study prior to the IDNT, the pilot study to make sure that in the herbicide and diabetic nephropathy trial, that diabetic nephropathy or diabetic kidneys was actually what was going to be studied. They wanted to be, have some patients biopsy to make sure that we were really studying diabetes, or not we, but Dr. Robbie was really studying diabetes and Dr. Lewis. And so they biopsied 36 patients who they assumed had diabetic nephropathy, and overwhelmingly, the majority of them did have diabetic kidney disease. Um, there was only, uh, I think, two patients that had something other. And so so the point I think is that when you really think a diabetic patient has diabetic nephropathy, your clinical suspicion is pretty good. When you think there's something outside of that, then maybe a biopsy is indicated. And in this case, I think the discussion that everybody's had so far with a relatively rapid onset, uh, the lack of retinopathy, uh, hyperlipidemia might point towards a photocytopathy. I think all of those are good enough indications to uh, do a uh, kidney biopsy in this case. Great. I think... Uh... We'll move on then and take us. We'll see what it is. I uh, want to start with a poll though here uh, about this because uh, if you remember last week, um, we put Bhavna on the wheel 100% because she uh, had been gone through about five months of fellowship and uh, had not, the, the wheel had not picked her. So we weighed the wheel 100% last week so it would pick her. I don't um, think Bob is allowed to vote, though, right? I mean, she. I don't know. I don't. It'd be hard. She. I think she's going to vote ten times here. But so, what I want to know is that uh, you know she only got to read it once. Should we use the old wheel uh, and have her pick it, or do we should go time? She's paid her dues. She's been lucky, and we should spin the real wheel. So her fate is in your hands, everybody. Um, it's so mean. <laughs> do you have like? Any, do you have an eraser that you're going to quickly change the wheels? I mean, this is going to be tough. I have two wheels. I'm Dude. ready to go. Wow. I, I have faith in mankind. That's what I, you know, I, I'm not, I have faith in mankind. I don't, I think we're, we're a nice, we're, people are nice. Um, what was it that Larry David said? Uh, you know, um, I don't like people. I just, I just like mankind. I just believe in mankind. I don't like people individually, but uh, very funny. Um, so, Bobna, <laughs> I predicted you were right. Uh, I was right. Uh, mankind was kind to you. They saved you from, uh, from me and uh so you're not going to have to automatically but 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 it could come up with you because it is the real wheel today so you can put the real wheel up and i'll spin it if it lands on bob now i'm going to really start believing in fate <laughs> well there's some little karma you know involved in all this so the wheel is okay good we're probably going to go back to dr height which you picked 90 percent of the time before last week uh, I'm not going to read. I've seen it. <laughs> so close. I could look pretty smart, but I'll be too honest. But goes it. around, comes around. Yeah, right. Ah, of course, it would go to Dr. Hyde. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Steve, hold on. You know, make sure your audio is working. Yep. Uh, there you go. I'm going to give you a remote control here. Give me a second. Just click on the screen. All right. All right. So first we have a trichrome here. This looks, honestly, not a lot of fibrosis at all. Some kind of here along the middle segment, but overall probably 10% or less, I would say. Yeah, I agree with that, Steve. Yeah, just focal. Looks like a good thick uh, gauge of needle they used. So. Yeah, you can tell this is definitely a Dr. Hamoud Dillon biopsy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so here we have PAS. 
um, one glomeruli in the center. I know one of the poll options was obesity related glomerulopathy, and this definitely does not look very large. Um, it just looking at the glomerulus itself, you can definitely see, I mean, I think these are the capillary walls here. They do look thickened, um, not something that's seen throughout, but it's kind of hard for me to tell if this is a mesangium or if it's the capillary itself. You yeah, look so at the periphery. Yeah, and the capillary wall should be the thickness of the tubular basement membrane. Okay. So they look, you know, roughly about the same, eyeballing it. Yeah. Yeah. What about diabetic nephropathy? Uh, do you see diffuse mesangial sclerosis? No, not at all. No. Right. Uh, and I mean, there's no KW nodules, pseudopatoslating, yeah. anything like that. Yep. Um, and then the tubules themselves outside of the glomerulus, this all looks okay. Yeah. And then uh, lastly, there's an arterial oh, right at sorry. I, 11 o'clock. I don't think those tubules are that okay. What'd you are say? They? I don't think those tubules are okay, particularly the one right below the glum about five, five, five o'clock. Elaborate. Yeah, I see a brush border there. Uh, I think there is quite a bit of aqualization of those yeah. cells. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's see what the H and E shows. Yeah, that, that's uh, Eagle Eye Mario. Uh, <laughs> that you could be right. That that does look a little vacuole. Gracias, yeah. David. For as good as the the tuft looks, the the uh, Bohm's capsule looks kind of like some periglomerular fibrosis, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, maybe as we cut it through a little bit, there'd be a little fibrosis next to it or something. Uh, the, over there at uh, at, at the left side of the glomerulus, looks like there's a little fibrosis outside the glomerulus uh, in the interstitium. But remember, yeah, there, how, there, yeah. But remember how old this patient is. Yeah. Seventy year old patient. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, real old guy. Yeah, but we, we we hide his we hide his identity, so he's he could actually be twenty five, and we just yeah. made him seventy. So, oh, okay. So no, no, he's yeah. he's close yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, right up there at noon is an arterial without any hyalinosis up up and to the left. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Keep going straight up. Here. Yeah. Do you yeah. see the lining? The lining on that is different than the tubules. That was an arterial. Got it. Yeah. All right, so now we've got an H and E. Um, I mean, again, there's not really a ton of mesangial expansion here. I think it's more located within the walls. Yeah, there is a subtle, mild little capillary wall thickening, very subtle, like right at twelve o'clock. Uh, yeah, that one there looks a little, little rigid, stiffened. Is there a segmental scar over there at uh, like in between the two thirty or three o'clock, David, or no? No, no, no. There's there are no segmental scars. Okay. There's no hypercellularity here. Again, not yeah. seeing any modularity. Uh, right here, but. Oh, I think you're breaking up, Steve. Steve. We can't. Yeah. Uh, we can't make yeah, you. Out. Do you feel like there's a little bit of mesangial, I guess, segmental uh, expansion, or I mean, like right there? Yeah. Well, it's kind of deceiving because then on the PAS, it, it's it doesn't really seem there is yeah. the, there is any. Yeah. In that glomerulus, uh, in that tuft at three o'clock, is there extra stuff in the mesangium? Yeah. <laughs> I, I yeah I, I, that's what those... my my impression was but I think we're probably just seeing a on foss section of a basement membrane um okay yeah the congo red is negative for amyloid uh, okay. um so now I have a Jones stain just kind of looking for spikes and holes here, and they're just looking at the loops themselves. You're definitely seeing some here in this area, seeing some here down as well. 
seeing what looks like deposition to me up here in this area. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's diffused, but I would say that it's segmental. There's more spikes that are kind of seen along the outside of this capillary wall in this area. Were there others that you picked up on, Dr. Simulik? No, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it, it does look like there's kind of yeah, segmental yeah spikes and holes. Uh, over down at uh, five o'clock, um, yeah, and 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 go and go up to the right a little bit, right here. Y yeah, and, and, and yeah, those kind of like little moth-eaten, um, and up into the right a little bit more. Some of those on foss sections, yeah, in there, those are irregular. All right. Uh, so moving on to the IF, you can see again this this is like segmentally positive, um, but throughout the capillary walls, in segmental. So segmental within the capillary walls. Yeah, it, yeah. It, finely granular. Similar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see linear IgG in, in diabetes. I mean, granted, even even if you don't have, I mean, you know, in, in early diabetes, they can have you know, like glomerular based membrane, membrane thickening and and cross-linking with uh, AGs and IgG, but this is definitely not linear, right? Correct. More, more granular, as you described. Not linear, and the areas that are negative aren't, aren't linear either, so. Go ahead, Steve, click on the screen again. There you go. I mean, uh, there are some areas in that glomerulus that look pseudo-linear, but that uh, can be a, an expression of the lack of resolution of IF microscopy. Uh, that should could be just confluent electron dense deposits. We don't know until we see the EM, but I think we all I think we already got a snapshot into that just yeah. a minute ago. So here's the EM. Um, impressive. Yeah. So I mean just looking here, I can't see really any photocytes whatsoever. Um, in the towards the urinary space here, and obviously there's plenty of deposition that's throughout both of these basement membranes, um, right on the side here, and then here as well. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. What, what, what side of the basement membrane, Steve? So this uh, sub epithelial. Yeah. That is possible. All right, um, and then moving along here to again urinary space and capillary space, more deposits that we're seeing in sub epithelial area. Yeah. No, I mean, here's some photocytes finally, um, but otherwise these do look diffusely effaced. Yeah, and we could also make out some rare spikes too coming off the basement membranes. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're, they're at, the, at the curve. This is kind of what you're talking about? No, no, no you're on the photocyte right now, but yeah. if you go around the corner a little bit, you can see, yeah, right there. Yeah. So those are the spikes we were seeing on the silver stain. Got it. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then just one more EM here. Um, it's like sub epithelial again. And just a lot of deposition. Is there any significance to the inside of this capillary space here, Dr. Simbaluk? No, I, th I think that's, an, uh, you know, we're getting a cross section of an endothelial cell. Thing, uh, you know, I don't know if this is uh, still considered a, a thing or not, but you know the stages of membranous and where these deposits are. I'm extremely impressed how many there are, and they all seem, you know, fairly uh, early. You know, there's some spikes. I don't see any intramembranous deposits. Certainly, don't see any uh, being absorbed deposits. It makes me, you know, kind of go along with the case where it, it did have a, an abrupt feel. Um, anybody buy into that? How long does it take for the basement membrane to kind of come around the deposits to cause those spikes, David? I don't know. Maybe Dr. Glassick or Mario know. Uh, I, I think it takes weeks to months. Yeah. Cause I see, I see, I see the basement membrane coming through yeah. or yeah. around. Yeah. Well, we don't have serial biopsies in individual patients, so that's a very difficult question to ask. In animal models, it takes uh, it takes many, many, many months or even years. 
So it's a very slow process. Uh, but I, I can't tell you in an individual patient how long it takes because you need serial biopsies. And now, in lupus membranous, uh, sometimes the degree of nephrosis is related to the degree of podocyte effacement as opposed to the amount of deposits you have. And uh, so there may be part of that that's the nephrosis is podocyte effacement here still, but obviously those deposits are significant. What what test, Steve, would you want uh, next? But as Roger mentioned, I mean, the church Strauss classification, which was abandoned and regained now again in some places, is helpful. I mean, this is what most people will consider an early form of membranes. Right. Yeah, I just I'm just impressed at how many that it's been a while since I've seen a membranous. It's almost it almost looks like a dense deposit. It's so mm -hmm. there's so many deposits there. Very impressive. And and you know, Bill said, I don't know if the, this patient was very nephrotic. I don't know how well that correlates either with the amount of deposits or the foot process effacement or combination of both. But they're both very impressive. You know, interestingly, yesterday at Baylor Nephrology Conference, we saw a similar case that turned out to be a secondary membrane is due to syphilis. And interestingly, I learned that in syphilitic membranes, you can catch it. If you catch it early, it has a similar appearance to what we are seeing. S secondary what, Mario? Syphilis. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they figured out the antigen with that as well. I don't remember off the top of my yeah. head which somebody, one. Was. Somebody, just, uh, somebody just asked what the next test should be. Do you going to have a poll? On no, that, or are um, you asking the? Well, yeah, I think he was asking Steve. Really, you know, um, the, the the point is we've got a membranous here, which is PLA two R negative, and uh, well, PLA two R negative in the serum. In the serum, yeah. And by your uh, So yeah. we don't have the PLA two R in the biopsy yet. So I think someday uh, but, we're going to. Uh, you, you know, know I mean, with a negative. With a negative circulating PLA2R in a patient with this lesion, uh, in my opinion, the first test is anti NL1. That is the most common uh, after uh, PLA2R, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it was figured out after thrombospondin, so thrombospondin in the literature is brought up a lot, but I think that the second most common is NL1. Right. I mean, hopefully someday we'll be ha we'll, it, we'll just be able to run a panel of them. Um, and, uh, but I suppose if you wanted to be statistically uh, inefficient, you would do NEL1. And if that was negative, you could start looking at other things like extosocial and thrombospondin, et cetera, contact. There's a whole number of them. And some of them are much more highly associated with different conditions. And you could probably point, point towards them, or you just do a complete panel. I don't, I don't know. So, Steve, what do you want based on that? In, that's exactly what I would do. I mean, I think you do. No one, and I think you do thrombospondin, and I think you see what comes back. And and David, you you did PLA two R on the biopsy, right? Y yes, yes, it was negative. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Gash, you said something. Think... Oh, go ahead, Steve. I think the other pattern will be it's... segmental pattern will be more consistent with NEL one. Yeah, and that's why I was just asking Casey. He put that in the chat. Uh, so the significance of segmental seems there's a little. Yeah, bit... that's what I was referring to. Yep, that's right. No one. Let's be fair, Dr. Reen brought it up as well. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it's a race, it's a race to Nell. It's a race to Nell. All right. Well, um, what do we have? Drum roll. Positive. Steve, you want to tell us what it shows? Yeah, I mean, that looks like it's Nell one positive to me. You know what's interesting is it's a lot more, it's a lot less segmental here than it was on the uh on the IF, I, maybe that would have just happened to be the glomerulus we picked, or maybe uh, this is more sensitive. Uh, does anybody know with, with when it's segmental on IF, is it typically uh, global? Yeah, all the all the glomeruli look like this in the biopsy. And 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 the glomeruli on the IF were all segmental. Yeah. Interesting. Anybody have any anybody hear that before? Have any thoughts on that? That's that's pretty interesting to me. But Dr. Reem brought it up already that if you have a segmental appearance, it suggests uh, in the setting of PLA to our negativity now. 
negated ailments. So, yeah, I'm just I'm just bringing up the the the, the discrepancy and the diffuse. I mean, how global this is, and how on, on the Nell stain, yet it was so segmental on the on the IgG IF. Um, so let's. In move my on. little experience, uh, Dr. Radbi, in the drug induced Nell one, especially those with the mercury and uh, hair straightening things or thiol containing uh, drugs, is generally not segmental. It's my personal opinion. When you see a segmental NEL1, uh, I will be pursuing a malignancy workup in this patient too. Now, okay, so Dr. Seti makes the point that if you have a segmental appearance, it's suggestive of a NEL1 process in PLA to R negative process. Um, so, uh, Dr. Reen, what would you do? What is your what? What are you going to do with this? What do you? What, what is your workup? What are your questions? My question would be a good drug history. Uh, if he is taking any, um, um, let's say, um, uh, uh, anything containing benzol, uh, thiol type of thing, such as I can't remember the name of that kidney stone drug, ticanonide or something like that, but make sure he's not taking any over the counter drugs or herbal medication or something containing mercury, those will be the things. But in this guy, I will definitely work up aid appropriate uh, malignancy if the drug history is negative. I think what Dr. Reen is, uh, the drug that he's thinking about is lipoic acid, which is the over-the-counter supplement, which some people take as a preventative measure. You have to have the patient bring in the bottles in order to determine whether lipoic acid is in them, because it's in the ingredient list. But Dr. Whittier has a little discussion here, but before we do that, um, we, uh, yeah, malignancy was brought up. Uh, we do have a, a quick poll. What would you do now? How would you treat this patient along with a cancer screening? But I want you to realize that colonoscopies at, in Chicago right now are scheduled three months. You'll get it, lucky if you get it done within three months. It may even be longer. So that's just a practical point when you decide what you're going to do. Um, so would you do RAS inhibition? Let's forget about SGLT2. Just RAS inhibition. Watch with or without you. With, watch for six months. Would you do RAS inhibition with SGLT2 with a CNI and watch for six months? Would you give rituximab now during cancer screening? Rituximab only after cancer screening, or go directly to a Pondicelli cyclophosphamide-based protocol because of the severity of the of the nephrosis? So, pick your poison or your lack of poison, if you will. Um, and we'll see what people say, and then I'll hand it over to Bill. I, I'm surprised, Dr. Uh, Rodby, you didn't add prednisone in this. Let's say it is a drug-induced, uh, like uh, uh, the, the complementary drug-induced. If they don't uh, uh, remit with the cessation of the drug, there is some evidence that uh, short course of prednisone may work in this situation. Are you but talking I, for, I, like, I, with, with what, non steroidals or what? With any, uh, especially these complementary lipoic acid and oh. mercury containing stuff and all those things. Okay, uh, good point. It, it is a paper which I was a little bit of co author in that one, May of KIR uh, this year. Uh, there's a good review on that 147 patient from our institution and from India describing NEL1, uh, how, how, what was the management and different group of patients. So I'm, gl was... I'm, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, steroids have been pretty much thrown out of my mind with uh, with any, you know, with membranous. So um, that's a good point. Uh, maybe you can share that with us later. Um, the number one uh, choice here is rituximab now during cancer screening. Uh, let's get something going. Um, but, you know, 20% said uh, just RAS and SGLT, watch for uh, six months. Um, you could add a CNI, and that's not a bad idea if you're watching, just to get the proteinuria down. This patient is fairly significantly nephrotic. Uh, we didn't talk about anticoagulation. I think you probably want to anticoagulate this guy in the interim. Uh, and then 27% uh, wanted to wait for cancer screening, uh, and uh, one person picked Ponticelli. I'm, I, we could go over the, the pros and cons of these, but we're a little, little – uh, Short on time, so I'm going to hand it back to Bill. 
I'm going to give you control, Bill. Here, uh, sure. go ahead. But don't uh, don't rush, Bill. I know uh, we got plenty of time. We're good. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. So all good points. So uh, let's see if I can advance it here. And make sure uh, you can hear me. I'm not muted. Okay. Um, so, you know, membranous and its many causes. I'm hoping, just like Dr. Robbie said, that we can eventually get to the day where there's a panel that we can serologically click off PLA2R and NEL and thrombospon and exostosin and all that. Uh, right now, we don't have that availability except for the PLA2R, which has really changed, I think, you know, biopsy characteristics and who you're going to biopsy. So I think the advent of PLA2R has been amazing. Um, for this person, there was persistence of his nephrotic syndrome uh, after we started an ARB and uh, Flozin, uh, as well as controlled his uh, symptoms with diuretics. Uh, also, even though his abdomen was not less than two, uh, given the, de the decision to wait, I did not want a PE or DBT to happen, so I also put him on Eliquis. And you can see here his response here, the orange is his proteinuria, and the blue is his serum albumin, so no real change even though his ARB and it flows and got him down a little bit from his 16 grams down to, you know, he was still very, very nephrotic. And his albumin over time, over a six month period had also been slowly decreasing. Uh, as far as workup, historically, he did not take any lipoic acid. Uh, he wasn't taking anything supplemental at all. Um, I really had a very long discussion with him to try to make sure that that was the case. Uh, there was no skin lightening creams, anything like that. I checked a mercury level anyway, and it was undetectable. Uh, because the association was sarcoid, I got vitamin D panel and um, ACE level, which was normal. Two years ago, he had a normal colonoscopy. So there's that. Um, and uh, about a year ago, he had a chest abdomen at the pelvis that was normal, but he hadn't had a CT chest to this uh, uh, CT chest. Uh, and I also checked a PSA. So I ordered a CT chest and, um, uh, and then I was going to get him up for further therapy, which I'll discuss here. So this would be the, a great panel, and there's more and more discovered every day, and these are just some of them. I think um, the one that was associated with uh, uh, syphilis that um, that was just discussed earlier um, uh, is NDNF, and so that's one that you want to think about there. Um, but NEL1 is now actually the second most common cause of membranous compared to, is at least reported, compared to um, PLA2R positive. And and it's particularly important to think about this with segmental, as we discussed. Here's all the different causes. There's many of them. They're still in idiopathic. We think about it with NSAID-related. Uh, lipoic acid, for sure, is uh, other meds. Um, mercury has really been implicated, especially with the skin lightening creams. Um, and also the sulfadiol medicines that was talked about, too. So when you look at the NEL1 membranous, how many of them have traditional medicine use versus no, it was pretty impressive in this study that in NEL1 membranous, 35% of the patients had some sort of traditional medicine use. And since malignancy is also one of the associations with NEL1, I, I, I'm, I, it's, it's very possible that it still is, but it's also very possible that a lot of patients with malignancy are taking a lot of traditional or non-traditional medicines. Um, and a lot of herbal medications. So I'm not quite sure that history is as clean as we want it to be. Um, it, it requires a very good history, and a lot of patients aren't willing to tell their doctors what they're taking as far as when it's an herbal medication or not. So even though it is associated with malignancy, I'm not sure it's as clean as we want it to be. It still means, I think, that we should screen our patients for malignancy when they have no one. Um, but it might be that uh, when all this comes to be said and done, that uh, it might just be all medication-induced. So Lipoic acid is the big one. We're going to talk about that in just a second. I'm going to actually go through that paper a little bit with, from May of 2024, just last month that uh, Dr. Reen had mentioned. Um, but this was the, the, the same paper of mem membranous nephropathy with or without the use of traditional ind indigenous meds. And, and really a lot more PLA2R positive and NEL1 positive with, with um, the native medications. So what are they? They weren't all published in this paper. I added more to this list. Um, but there is this association with the sulfhydryl groups, and that's in thiola, uh, the tiopronin. We all know that that, when we're treating cystinuria, can be uh, uh, a membranous nephropathy. And there's a case now that shows that thiola is associated with NEL1. That might be the old sulfa moiety of captopril. Captopril is associated with uh, a membranous back in the day as well. No one really uses captopril as much anymore. We'll probably see it less and less, but maybe it's that sulfa group. That's the link there. And even the sulfhydro group on lipoic acid might be the link. So there's that kind of big association. And then there's the other one of the heavy metals. 
uh, mercury and gold. And someone in the chat earlier asked about lead exposure. I haven't seen lead as a cause of uh, memoryness yet, but it's possible that that's out there too. Um, and the mercury we see is not just from eating a lot of fish, but we're seeing quite a bit more in the skin lightning creams. Um, actually, Dr. S uh, Sena Naruzi and I are publishing a case uh, that's in press right now of a, of a woman with a skin lightning cream who developed now one membranous from her cream and had an elevated mercury level. I didn't really think mercury levels were that easy to get, but it's a, send out, it's a test that you can get on the local lab. And so I got it in our case and it was negative. Hey, Bill. Um... Yep. You know, back in the day when, uh, before we had drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, we used gold and penicillamine, and that, you know, we both seem to be associated with it. I hadn't thought about this for, for, for but forever. Um, do we know uh, with gold, when they get uh, membranous, is that uh, the same thing as, uh, like, like uh, is it Nell? I, I assume that, like, Captopril, where we won't really see it because no one's using it as much anymore, but I, I assume that that was always Nell, just like the Captopril was probably always Nell. You know, uh, I can share a patient of mine, which we are about to write it up. Uh, she actually presented three, four years ago with the lipoic acid nell related uh, uh, as, uh, as membranous and glomerulonephritis. So we stopped lipoic acid and uh, she remitted within about uh, two months. Uh, a year, about six months ago, she came back with a relapse of uh, nephrotic range proteinuria. And um, this time um, we did further testing and we I know that her mercury level was negative in the first uh, two, two and a half years ago. It was negative in the, uh, in the blood and the urine. Uh, so we were sure that it was lipoic acid, but when she relapsed, she was used, she was from India and she was using skin lightening cream and she relapsed. So I think common, commonality in both those drugs was sulfahydryl type of thing. So I wouldn't be surprised gold salt was also a NEL positive uh, glomerulonephritis. Can I, I want to just, has anybody seen Captopril induced nephrotic syndrome? Dick, I mean, anybody? Uh, yeah, I, I had, I saw one case soon after it was put on the market. And was it, did the biopsy, it was membranous? Mm -hmm. Anybody else, Mario? It went away when we stopped the Captopril too. I ne I have never seen a case. Dr. Reen, have you ever seen Captopril? No, 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 I'm not. Exceedingly yeah. rare, but I, you know, uh, Bill, you want to tell the Dr. Lewis story without swearing really, really quickly? Can you really tell a Dr. Lewis story without swearing? <laughs> I don't, it's kind of like telling a Dr. Corbett story without using your middle finger. I don't think either <laughs> can happen. Happy birthday, Steve. Uh, so yeah, no, he just, he reviewed the cases for the uh, FDA of captopril induced um, membranous. Uh, and he was, this was also right around the time of uh, uh, the captopril study coming out. And so really, we obviously, it, it was, you know, we, I think that the goal was to try to get ACE inhibitors in a lot of people. Uh, because it was found to be renal protective. And so that was scaring some people. Uh, and he said he reviewed them and he came back and said, uh, the FDA is crazy. There's no effing way that Captopril causes membranous. And that's what I learned in my fellowship. <laughs> but now knowing this, you know, the science is bearing out that if it does, it has these sulfa groups and the sulfhydro group, I really like the physiology of, or the pathophysiology of it possibly uh, uh, being implicated there. And, and And just like Dick just said, I mean, if you have a case where the it's the product after Captopril started, you take Captopril away, then a product syndrome goes away. That's that's a pretty good uh, story for Captopril causing it. The only better story would be to rechallenge, and I'm not quite sure there's any reason to do so. Um, so just to sort of finish this off here, we will, um, this was from one of the cases, just leaning a little bit more into the segmental membranous part of this that Dr. Um, Gashti had mentioned in the chat earlier, and everybody kind of jumped on. Um, segmental membranous is pretty rare, okay? But when it is segmental, NEL1 is the, is the is the big one. It's something like 97% of the segmental membranous membrani that are out there are um, due to due to NEL1. And it's associated with the malignancy, this indigenous meds that we talked about, and also the sulfahydryl groups, lipoic acid and mercury. Those are the ones that we want to think about. And this is from that 2024 article from just last month, which they actually looked at the outcomes of many, many patients that had NEL1 membranous nephropathy, and then they broke it down into those that had lipoic acid and those that did not. And very interestingly, 
those that um, had lipoic acid, of course, uh, in one, uh, um, they didn't uh, require immunosuppression because they were able to hold the lipoic acid and have it go away. So they had an 88% remission without immunosuppressive therapy. So what I really take home from this is when you have a NL1, obviously we have to search for all these causes, but it might be really the important one to kind of wait. Wait that classic six months that KDGO recommends of just using maybe an ACE or an ARB or Flozin because it might have a spontaneous remission, not spontaneous, if you can find the underlying cause and remove it. Um, and I think that the, it's possible that all the ones that are spontaneous remissions of membranous are those that we can find, find that inciting factor and remove it. Um, so I, I think if you have a NL1, it's better to kind of search for those things, but I wouldn't rush into using rituximab uh, immediately like I might if it's a pretty nephrotic person with um, with uh, a PLA2R membranous. I think we're going to find out with time that it's possible that the spontaneous remission rate of PLA2R membranous is less than that of uh, NL1 because of these drugs. Now, in our case, that's what I did. I said, I'm going to hold out. We're going to find out that this is going to spontaneously remit. <laughs> and of course, he didn't. And I wasn't able to find any secondary causes. And so I'm actually now, after it's been nine months now, he's still just as nephrotic, and I'm going to set him up to get uh, rituximab. Uh, he's gotten all of his colon cancer screening, and he got his uh, CT scan uh, now done just this last week. And so, and that was all normal. And so I'm going to go ahead and set him up to uh, get rituximab. But I think that the, it's good to think about the spontaneous remission rate, uh, particularly with now one, because if we can find this inciting factor. Hey, Bill, the, um, your proteinuria, your serial proteinuria had gone in about half, right? It went from 16 down to like eight to nine, and then it stayed down at eight to nine for nine months. And, and his abdomen is still oh. kind of dropping. It's, you know, it was two, four. Now it's close to one, nine. I'm sorry if I missed it, but the timeline for the spontaneous remissions for the lipoic, I mean, for the uh, now ones. Uh, let's see if it's here. Um, um, Roger. All right. I don't yeah, know that. that. Oh, here it is. You know, the, uh, the Polanco paper, which is the classic paper now cited for looking at spontaneous remissions, of course, had no information on PLA2R or NEL or anything, but it did have a piece of information that's often ignored, is that ACE and ARBs did nothing, zero, in patients who had over eight grams of proteinuria per day. There was no benefit in terms of, of remissions. Now, yes, the proteinuria might fall from 11 grams to 10 and a half grams or nine grams or eight grams, but clinically, that isn't a terribly meaningful response for the patient or for the prognosis. So I, I, I think, and, and uh, Fernando's looked at this in his uh, large membrane series, and, and he says he's never seen a response to uh, ACE and ARBs in a patient with membranous nephropathy and a serum uh, urine protein over 10 grams a day. I, I think that I'm all in favor of going in for attacking an antibody when it's still present. I guess just my point is if we're able to somehow remove the antibody by stopping one of these medicines and in a segmental membranous, if you don't can't get the NEL stain, maybe it's more likely that it's a medicine, uh, then that might be enough to stop the antibody from the antigen antibody complex from, you know, from depositing, from being there. Uh, and so I think that if it is a segmental one or uh, due to one of these drugs, it gives you a little bit more leeway to wait. Otherwise, in some of the other ones where the antibody, I don't think is going to go away. I'm hugely in favor of not waiting six months with ACE and ARBs like KDGO can recommend and just going right in and hitting them with some rituximab or whatever the treatment of choice that I, is going to be that I want to give them. Your logic is great. I mean, I think it makes perfect sense. I don't think I could have waited with that, with, with that degree of proteinuria, but I also, you know, such a firm believer in rituximab and, and it's, and it's so well tolerated that, that, uh, uh, generally speaking, at least that I think I would have just gone ahead, but, uh, I don't know, you know, but I uh, would look at this. I mean, eight, you know, 88% remission without immunosuppression. That's, I mean, that's on an average, on an average, they stopped it. In that my case is different. 
Yeah, right. but it's also it's also ten months. Maybe I can go four months and then uh, less morbidity, less anticoagulation. I'm not arguing either way. I think it's the, the, an extremely important difference here that we don't. You know, I'm such a lumper. That's my problem. I mean, it might be a, a something good at times. I'm such a lumper that uh, this is good. It points out that there's you know very there's differences. Just like exostosin has a different uh, 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 phenotype and prognosis and everything else. And you can't just put them all in the same uh, category as membranous. Rituximab. So you're, it's very, very good point. I'm glad you made it. it but I don't, I don't know what the answer is, but it's certainly uh, quite valid and, and you, very useful information when we have these cases. Um, so you, you're just starting it now, Bill? Yeah, I've, already, I've ordered it and he hasn't, um, and, and he hasn't been able to get it yet because that takes about as long as to get a colonoscopy. But in summary, when we have a segmental one, think Nell. One, there's less frequent uh, with the segmentals to be nephrotic syndrome. That's been reported. Uh, more often preserved renal function with the segmentals. And the majority of the segmentals are now one. 70% uh, of the non-nephrotic patients had complete or partial remission with conservative therapy alone in the segmental ones. Okay. And so that kind of points towards the secondary one that I was talking about. And, and, and that was just the point to always think about that. I, I've not liked KDGO recommending on everyone to use ACE or ARB and Flozin for six months prior to, uh, to, to using Rituxan. Terrific. Uh, Dick, can you send us an email with the, that reference about uh, the spontaneous remission, and then I'll, I'll get it to everybody else. Yeah, the senior author is Polanco, P-O-L-A-N-C-O. -O. It's from Spain, and it's in Jason about 10 years ago. I don't know. The, I'll, I'll send you the... Roughly. Yeah, great. And then we'll send it out to everybody. Uh, wonderful. Uh, great discussion. Fun case. Happy birthday, Steve. Uh, Bob, nice, the, the wheel and, and society. Uh, we have faith in society. They treated you kindly. Uh, thanks, Bill. Great discussion. Um, and everyone else that contributed. We should be back in two weeks. We'll let you know. Uh, until then, everybody stay safe.